As the federal investigation into an employee's allegations that Wyoming Medical Center submitted fraudulent Medicare claims comes to a close, the, Wyo the woman who started it all says she's relieved to finally speak out on the case that consumed six and a half years of her life. Gail Bryden worked for Wyoming Medical Center processing accounts when she first noticed something wasn't quite right in 2006. They were telling medical records to change the statuses in order to recoup that money because if they didn't and they charged it as an outpatient like the doctor had ordered it, they wouldn't be reimbursed. She felt ignored when she brought up her concerns. A light bulb came on that day, and I was never invited back to that meeting. But hospital CEO Vicki Diamond says staff addressed them. She was part of those committees. She was the first part of this initial investigation also. So, yes, we felt we responded appropriately. That's why we went to an intermediary for clarification. And so we did that. We have multitude of notes and everything of us trying to make sure we're complying with the guidelines. Prosecutors say the investigation did find evidence to support Bryden's claims, but administration maintains they never intended to do wrong. We admit we made those, we interpret those guidelines wrong. But again, it's a very, very small percentage. But in cases like these, even if it's completely accidental, U.S. attorneys say institutions that benefit from federal funding are held to a higher standard. As for Bryden, who will receive an unspecified amount in the settlement, it's a relief her role is finally over, but she'll continue to deal with repercussions for a long time. I've spent about 25 years in the health care field, and this has ruined me. And I didn't do anything wrong, you know. Um, and the people who have committed the crime, they're still there. They're still employed. Now, we would like to clarify there was no criminal or civil sentencing in this case. The U.S. attorneys involved won't comment further, but in a press release, an Office of Inspector General Rep says the case, quote, shows corporations allegedly seeking to increase profits at the expense of taxpayers can expect aggressive investigation. As Wyoming Medical Center moves past allegations of fraudulent Medicare claims, the hospital implements new standards and practices. It also faces increased federal scrutiny over the next several years. News 13 looks at how medical establishments try to avoid these same billing and coding errors on their watch. As part of the settlement terms, Wyoming Medical Center administrators signed what is called a Corporate Integrity Agreement, or CIA. The feds allow the hospital to keep federal funding in exchange for increased scrutiny over the next five years. We take this very, very seriously. So we now have a compliance officer, compliance committee. Our board's overseeing all of our compliance. We report quarterly to the board. Uh, we are very readily, we will not bill or we will report any errors that we think we've made to our intermediary. So we're more aggressive in doing that at this point in time. Some terms of a CIA include developing clear standards and practices, hiring independent review, as well as detailed annual reports to the Office of the Inspector General. But how do other medical institutions make sure the same errors don't happen on their watch? Mountain View Regional Hospital and Cheyenne Regional Hospital declined to comment, but News 13 spoke with one CASPER facility. The Community Health Center of Central Wyoming is a federally qualified health center, and as such, CEO Dan Reiner says correct billing records are crucial. If we've identified a miscoding of a service, we would actually go back to that, that provider and have a, a discussion about what, what was observed and then see if either they were wrong or maybe they, they didn't document everything they, they did do. The center uses a combination of internal and external review as well as continuing staff education. And Reiner says high standards will continue to be important as federal administrators crack down on the bleeding. Health and Human Services, HHS, which is really Medicare has really made a very, very strong push over the last probably 24 months to elevate um, the correctness to coding and billing throughout the country. And Diamond also adds the hospital will be contributing to efforts to clarify Medicare billing guidelines, and they're committed to billing correctly in the future. The number of Americans living in commuter marriages or domestic relationships has doubled in the past 20 years. Part of the rise is attributed to the recession, but in some ways it's also become a way of life for many modern Americans. Meet Andrew Bussey. He works here in Casper, and every other week he goes home to his soon-to-be wife in South Dakota. She's a nurse in the hospital in Rapid City, and 
I fly the helicopter for Wyoming Medical Center, and so we both go to the hospital on the same day. It's just a different hospital. The first couple nights uh, apart are hard, and the first couple of nights together are hard. So yeah, it's a constant readjustment every every couple of days. They'd like to live in the same place, but in today's economy, getting a transfer isn't that simple. In this day and age, there's a lot of people that are outsourcing their jobs, going other places, and commuting is getting a lot easier. And so, at this period in our life, we're both. You know, she's set in her job and I'm set in my job, and so we're trying to make the relationship work around our careers. They're part of a growing number of commuter couples, and therapist Shauna Puntney says it doesn't have to be a bad experience. When they have a realistic expectation that it's not always going to be easy, they do better. Uh, generally, um, you know, they know that uh, there's going to be hard times and they work through those and it makes them a stronger family unit. Of course, living apart does require adjustments such as defining clear expectations and boundaries. Good communication is important and um, you need to communicate regularly and often. We spend a good amount of time uh, Skyping, you know, talking to each other like that and FaceTime on our phones. Bussy is quick to point out though, even without the phones, he'd make it work. The fact is, like, if you had to go back to writing letters, I think the relationship would still survive. Census data shows about three and a half million couples in the U.S. were in commuter marriages in 2010, and the number continues to grow. And we regularly feature crime stories, deaths, accidents, or abuse cases, but there's another story that unfolds behind the scenes, the victims. Casper Police Department's Victim Response Unit is trained to provide whatever help a victim may need. And now they need your help. Sometimes we'll see uh, folks with complete shock. You know, they can't believe what's going on. And uh, sometimes you'll get scenes that the victim seems to be handling things okay, but it's after everybody leaves that things fall apart. That's where anonymous victim response unit volunteers come in. The first few minutes is very traumatic for people, so someone to be there and help them and kind of focus them helps them a lot, and it also helps law enforcement. They help Casper officers calm victims down, make phone calls to family, and provide any emotional support the person needs. I've been with women that have been victimized, and they wanted a woman there, not a man, and it's very nice to know that we can be there to help them at that point in time. Casper's unit consists of six volunteers right now, but they're looking to at least double the team so they can have two volunteers at every scene. There's different dynamics with male victim responders, and sometimes folks respond better to males than they do females, and vice versa. So wouldn't it be better to have both? Holscher points out, for example, men are beginning to report more when they are victims of domestic abuse. And because every situation is different, more diverse volunteers will help them better respond to victims' needs. And Jenny says her work helping victims is the most rewarding service she's ever given. It's a small amount of time that you pay to help your fellow man. Now, Casper PD will hold two 20-hour training seminars next month on the 13th and 14th and the 20th and 21st of October. You can pick up an application at the Hall of Justice downtown. And for more information, check out our Quick Links tab on kcwi13.com. And as the blaze on Casper Mountain continues to grow, residents from the western side of the mountain remember another fire. They say watching the smoke billow brings back memories of leaving their homes to an uncertain future six years ago. You watch it and you keep watching it and watching it. Just praying now. Don't let it keep going. I um, I went through a lot of ang anxiety and anguish. Uh, not knowing you couldn't blame anybody because it was lightning. But yet you wanted to blame somebody. The Burris family knows what it's like to be in the path of danger. The Coal Mountain blaze struck in 2006 within sight of their backyard. Fire started right up there. And Robert fought the Jackson Canyon fire that same summer. That's the devil. For him, it became personal when it threatened his home and his mother's. 
it was so hot that the trees in front of the fire was actually exploding. You could hear them and watch them explode. And the Jackson fire burned over 11,000 acres, stopping just short of the Burris's homes. But as the sheep herder fire threatens to grow larger with no sign of stopping, Wyoma says she knows what residents are going through. Not for us this time, but I'm heart sick for other people. As they watch the fire's progression together, they can't help but compare it to their own six years ago. I don't think it was near the ferocity the, that this fire is because there, there just don't seem to be any stopping it. Robert says fire has become a part of life. I've lost friends in fires that I've made friends from other fires and lost them. And, you know, and it, it affects us all. And what Ellen remembers most is how the community always comes together after the destruction. Oh, I've seen things come and go, but the people don't change. They're awful forgiving and they're awful friendly, and they care about each other. While the 2006 fire burned nearly 12,000 acres, it didn't destroy any permanent residences. But fire officials tell us the sheep herders fire has already hit several structures and it continues to spread. A series of suspicious fires in a Paradise Valley neighborhood had some residents wondering just how safe they were in their own homes. But after last night's most recent incident, fire officials discovered the culprit was a child with a fascination for flames. It's a peaceful suburban neighborhood, but over the summer, half a dozen random yard fires broke out, all in the same area. None of them caused any major damage, and they were easily contained. But as the fire trucks kept coming back, some began to wonder if they were really just accidents. When there were multiple fires, then you start getting nervous, and you start watering down your roof and things like that because you don't know where it's going to happen next. And Wednesday night, when Casper firefighters responded to yet another fire, they discovered the instigator. One of our investigators was able to determine that uh, there was uh, a young person who had some curiosity and was playing with fire. And so now we're confident that, that those fires in that area are, are, are going to cease. Smith says it's natural for children to be curious, but when that curiosity turns to experimentation, it's time to step in. Unfortunately, fire play is a larger problem than most people want to admit. Sometimes, like I said before, um, that's an unhealthy curiosity and it requires more intervention. Uh, we've got individuals in our department who are trained uh, to meet with those with families. We also include sometimes counselors, um, school administrators, things of that nature so that uh, we're attacking the problem from a big picture standpoint. Neighbors tell News 13 they're relieved to know it wasn't malicious. I just feel really sad for her and for her family. But the source of the fires was certainly a surprise. She just kind of brightens up the neighborhood. Actually, she's always been very friendly and sweet to me. So I just hope that things can be resolved in a way that's helpful to her. I spoke with off camera expressed the same feelings of support for the family and they said they had no hard feelings. Officials won't press charges since the girl is a minor and did not cause any real damage. More Wyoming mothers are breastfeeding their babies and for longer. News 13's Lydia DeFranchi shows us how improved hospital practices just earned the state high scores on the CDC's breastfeeding report card. And Lydia, what's making the difference here? Corey, health administrators say better support right after birth and then following up later on have made a big difference in helping mothers nurse their children. I thought it would come really naturally, but breastfeeding actually was really difficult in the beginning. Meyer's experience is one many new mothers share, but getting support from other parents and dedicated organizations can make a big difference. Here at Wyoming Medical Center, the women's services staff has made breastfeeding a priority with the help of lactation consultants and follow-up visits. It's not just the hospital, it is a community-wide uh, progress that we've made with it. Changes in attitudes also help. Now there's not quite the stigma of, well, oh, I'm going back to work so I can no longer breastfeeding, or should we dare mention breastfeeding in public? And it seems to be working. Based on data such as the number of children breastfeeding, legislative support, and formula use in hospitals, Wyoming's score on the CDC breastfeeding report card has jumped more than six points since 2009. Mommy. Meyer says she had great help from breastfeeding support groups, other moms, and even random strangers. People would stop me in the mall and tell me, well, you're such a good mom for breastfeeding and all that. She works as a lactation consultant now, helping even more mothers give their children what she says is the best nutrition. 
it is a public health issue, definitely. I think that we just need to normalize it. We need to breastfeed in public. We need to do that to make people okay with it. The CDC's breastfeeding report card is part of a health department initiative called Healthy People 2020. In Wyoming, 80% of women breastfeed at some point after birth, but the biggest challenge to achieving those goals is encouraging women to keep it going for at least six months. Corey? All right, thanks, Lydia. That's Lydia DeFranchi, our newest reporter. The CDC ranks Wyoming well above the national average. Just over 20% of women are exclusively breastfeeding six months after giving birth.